Lagu Negaraku dan Yutem Terbilang akan dinyanyikan. Hadirin dipersilakan duduk. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Wira Dr. Raha Abdul Rahim, NAP Chancellor University Teknikal Malaysia Melaka. Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Asma Ismail, Presiden Akademi Sains Malaysia. Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Teknologis Dr. Syahrin bin Sahib mantan naib chancellor UTEM, pengurusan tertinggi universiti, pegawai-pegawai kanan universiti, yang berusaha Encik Mazhar bin Mahat, ketua pegawai operasi, yang berusaha Encik Muhammad Azmi bin Mat Said, ketua bahagian pembangunan bakat pejabat pendaftar, seterusnya para hadirin yang dihormati sekalian. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera Salam melakaku maju jaya Rakyat bahagia Menggamit dunia Negeri Melaka penuh budaya Khazanah bangsa tidak terkira Selamat datang pembuka bicara Di auditorium chancellery Kita bersua Alhamdulillah pada pagi yang barokah ini Kita dapat bersama berkumpul dalam program Executive Talk Bersama yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Asma Ismail Yang bertajuk Where is Higher Education Heading Post COVID-19 Lebat kemiri pohon rendah Dahan terikat tali perkasa Sepuluh jari kami menadah Mohon berkat yang maha esa Bagi memberkati majlis pada pagi yang mulia ini Majlis dimulakan dengan bacaan doa Auzubillahiminasyaitanirrajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Segala puji bagi Allah Tuhan sekalian alam Selawat dan salam ke atas jundungan Nabi Muhammad SAW Ahli keluarganya dan para sahabat sekalian Ya Allah, sesungguhnya kami bersyukur kepadamu Kerana memberi nikmat kesihatan dan kesejahteraan Yang dapat dinikmati oleh semua staf UTM khususnya Dan rakyat di negara ini amnya Ya Allah, kekalkanlah pembangunan yang telah kami laksanakan Sama ada yang berbentuk material atau spiritual Martabatkanlah universiti kami dan tingkatkanlah produktiviti kami Kami bersyukur kepadamu Ya Allah Kerana kemajuan yang kami perolehi adalah hasil daripada usaha dan rahmat Yang telah engkau anugerahkan kepada kami Ya Allah, sempena program Executive Talk ini Kami memohon ihsan daripadamu Ya Allah Agar engkau kurniakan kepada kami Tekad dan istiqamah Dengan segala usaha yang kami usahakan Tambahkan nikmat kesejahteraan Dan keselamatan yang berterusan Lindungi kami daripada segala keburukan dan keaiban Hindirah, Hindarilah kami Daripada segala rupa bentuk kemungkaran dan kemaksiatan Peliharilah kami daripada segala bencana Anugerahkanlah kepada kami kesihatan Agar kami dapat berbakti kepada agama Bangsa dan negara yang tercinta ini Ya Allah Tuhan yang menguasai sekalian alam Engkau cambahkan nilai-nilai ukhuah dalam gerak kerja kami Berikanlah kami kesenangan dan kemudahan Dalam melaksanakan gerak kerja kami Demi membangunkan universiti kami Berikanlah kekuatan kepada pemimpin-pemimpin universiti Agar mereka mampu membawa Universiti Teknikal Malaysia Melaka ini Terus maju memacu kecemerlangan. Berilah kepada kami kekuatan dalam membantu pengurusan universiti Bagi mengemudi kapal ini menuju kecemerlangan di dunia, di dunia dan akhirat Ya Allah, engkau peliharalah perpaduan di antara kami Demi kepentingan universiti yang kami kasihi Ya Allah, kami bersyukur kepadamu Kerana dapat hidup dalam keadaan aman Damai, harmoni, percaya mempercayai Serta hormat menghormati Tolong menolong Yang menjadi tunjang kepada kemakmuran Kemakmuran universiti kami Sehingga ke hari ini Ya Allah, wahai Tuhan kami yang pengasih Lagi maha penyayang Kami mohon restu kepadamu Engkau anugerahkanlah universiti kami ini Menjadi universiti yang setanding dengan universiti-universiti Di negara-negara maju lain di, di, di dunia ini Engkau kekalkanlah momentum kejayaan ini Untuk generasi kami dan generasi yang akan datang Engkau kuningkanlah kepada kami kekuatan Semangat dan kesabaran yang tinggi Untuk membentuk generasi baru Yang bersifat Rabbani Yang boleh memakmurkan dan memajukan universiti ini Agar perjuangan awal yang dirintis oleh orang-orang yang terdahulu daripada kami Tidak akan menjadi sia-sia Allahumma ya hafiz ya muhaimin Pelihalilah universiti ini ya Allah Agar kami menjadi warga universiti yang sehat Berdisiplin, bertoleransi, pemurah Intelektual, berinovasi dan berkompetensi Serta hidup di universiti ini bagaikan satu keluarga Peliharalah kejayaan ini ya Allah Supaya hati kami, jiwa kami dan minda kami Sentiasa berada dalam keimanan yang teguh Dan dapat memakmurkan negara Malaysia tercinta ini Allahumma ja'alna jam'ana haza jam'an marhuma Wa tafarruqana min ba'dihi tafarruqan maksuma Rabbana atina fid dunya hassanah وفي الآخرة هسنا وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين Amin amin ya rabbal alamin. Mudah-mudahan dengan bacaan doa itu tadi, majlis kita pada hari ini akan mendapat keberkatan dan sentiasa berada dalam lingkungan lingkungan rahmatnya Hadirin sekalian, program pada hari ini diadakan adalah bertujuan 
untuk memperkasakan penyelidikan ilmu dalam rangsang pemikiran-pemikiran baru bagi memacu strategi dan matlamat organisasi serta negara tercapai dan dapat melahirkan sumber manusia yang berkualiti dan cemerlang. Urat meranti pemangkin haba, titisan aur, pembawa erti, saat dinanti telah pun tiba, ucapan aluan kita amati. Hadirin sekalian, maju dengan segala hormatnya mempersilakan yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Wira Dr. Rahab Abdul Rahim, Nap Chancellor University Technical Malaysia Melaka untuk menyampaikan ucapan aluan dan memperkenalkan tokoh penceramah majlis mempersilakan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh Dan salam sejahtera Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Asma Ismail Pengucap utama program Executive Talk kali ini Datuk Syahrin Fauzul Encik Mat Datuk Nazri Pegawai Kanan Universiti Staff hadirin dan hadirat sekalian Yang saya kasihi Hari ini dia 56 orang patutnya Macam lebih daripada 56 Tapi Alhamdulillah kita masih ada social distancing It should be okay kot eh? Alhamdulillah So kalau kita ni nak masuk FB live Kita tunjuk yang kita ni sebenarnya jaga social distancing Ataupun physical distancing uh, Pertama kali Pertama sekali Marilah kita Melafazkan rasa syukur Ke hadrat ilahi Kerana dengan inayah dan kurnianya Dapat kita bersama-sama berhimpun pada pagi yang mulia ini bersempena program Executive Talk University Teknikal Malaysia Melaka. Alhamdulillah, UTEM sangat berbangga kerana beberapa minggu yang lepas ini, kita telah mendapat perkongsian ilmu daripada pihak industri iaitu daripada Datuk Syed Hussein. Semalam kita dapat mendengar Sastrawan dan Sekolah Unggul Negara Prof. Lim Suitin Dan hari ini UTEM disemarakkan lagi Dengan kehadiran Prof. Datuk Asma Ismail Yang akan bersama-sama berkongsi dengan kita uh, Saya mewakili seluruh warga universiti Mengucapkan setinggi-tinggi penghargaan Dan terima kasih kepada yang berbahagia Prof. Datuk Dr. Asma Ismail Kerana sudi memenuhi jemputan Sebagai pengucap utama program Executive Talk kali ini Walaupun pelaksanaan program pada kali ini agak berbeza kerana norma baru dan pematuhan terhadap SOP Perintah Kawalan Pergerakan, namun program ilmu seumpama ini wajar diteruskan dalam apa cara sekalipun. Sebagai makluman yang berbahagia Datuk dan hadirin sekalian, walaupun kehadiran peserta dihadkan di auditorium ini, namun program pada pagi ini adalah ditonton oleh seluruh warga universiti dan pelayar internet menerusi Facebook UTEM secara langsung insyaallah sebenarnya betul eh okey good dapat thumbs up daripada belakang sebab dia orang tengah tengah check ni berapa orang yang tengah tengok buat masa ni hadirin dan hadirat sekalian penganjuran program wacana seumpama ini merupakan platform terbaik bagi tokoh-tokoh negarawan ilmuwan dan cendekiawan negara untuk berkongsi ilmu pengetahuan dan pengalaman meluas Bersama seluruh warga universiti dalam menyokong pembangunan modal insan yang lebih cemerlang Alhamdulillah, bermula dari tahun 2014 UTEM telah berjaya menganjurkan beberapa siri program perkongsian ilmu Dari kalangan pengucap tama-pengucap tama terkemuka Seperti yang amat berhormat Tun Dr. Mahathir Muhammad Tun Datuk Seri Utama Dr. Muhammad Khalil bin Yaakob Akademisyen Tan Seri Dr. Insinyur Ahmad Tajuddin Ali yang berbahagia Datuk Seri Insinyur Dr. Zaini bin Ujang Yang berbahagia Tan Seri Prof. Dr. Zulkifli Razak Dan yang berbahagia Tan Seri Abdul Wahid Omar Pada hari ini, UTEM sangat bertuah kerana telah dapat meneruskan program bermanfaat ini Menerusi perkongsian yang akan kita dengar sebentar lagi insya Allah Dari yang berbahagia Prof. Datuk Dr. Asma Ismail Menerusi topik, topik perkongsian yang amat relevan dengan kita semua iaitu Where is Higher Education Heading Post-COVID-19 Hadirin dan hadirat yang dirahmati sekalian 
Sebelum kita mempersilakan atau sebelum saya mempersilakan yang berbahagia Datuk untuk menyampaikan perkongsian beliau, izinkan saya untuk mengambil sedikit masa walaupun tebal ni eh, saya cuba sedikit eh. Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan sekalian untuk kita sama-sama menelurus menelusuri latar belakang pengucap tama kita pada hari ini. Ha, kita nak tengok dia punya CV lah ni ya eh, Datuk. Eh. Profesor Datuk Dr. Asma dilahirkan di Jitra Kedah merupakan tokoh ilmuwan yang tidak asing lagi di dalam sektor pendidikan tinggi. Ini saya kena sebut nah minta maaf sikit tapi saya nak sebut juga she is my senior in college Tengku Kusha. Okay, a sister and definitely a mentor to me. Give her a big round of clap lah eh? <laughs> ah, sorry ada tu kena sebut juga eh? Okay, as a woman she has broken many glass ceilings in the world of men. Okay. Prof Asma merupakan naib chancellor wanita pertama di USIM dan USM, juga wanita pertama yang pernah dilantik sebagai ketua pengarah pendidikan tinggi. Sehingga kini, beliau masih kekal sebagai wanita pertama yang memegang jawatan Presiden Akademi Sains Malaysia dan wanita pertama menjadi pengerusi Agensi Kelayakan Malaysia MQA. Pada masa ini, Prof. Asma masih meneruskan penglibatan yang aktif di dalam bidang penyelidikan menerusi pelantikan sebagai Profesor Kehormat di Institute for Research in Molecular Medicine, USM dan Fellow Penyelidik di Biotechnology Research Institute, University Malaysia Sabah. Beliau juga adalah pemegang kerusi Ibnu Sina di Universiti Islam Antarabangsa Malaysia, Kampus Kuantan. Profesor Datuk Asma memiliki Bachelor of Science Biology dari University of Nevada Reno, ijazah Sarjana Microbiology dari Indiana University Bloomington, dan seterusnya PhD dalam bidang Cellular and Molecular Biology dari University of Nevada Reno, USA. Kepakaran beliau dalam bidang Microbiology disumbangkan menerusi penyelidikan saintifik sehingga berjaya menghasilkan 13 paten dan mengkomersilkan rapid diagnostic test for typhoid atau typhidot yang memenuhi standard dan piawaian WHO. Sumbangan beliau dalam penyelidikan typhoid juga. Typhoid ni TB ya. Eh? eh TB bukan TB, apa tu namanya? Demam kepialu. Ha, demam kepialu. Tu tuberkulosis, sorry silap. Okey, demam kepialu. Ha tu. Yang diiktiraf oleh Pusat Sains Negara dan beliau tersenarai di antara saintis wanita Malaysia Hall of Fame. Sebagai seorang penyelidik, Prof. Datuk Asma telah menerbitkan lebih daripada 131 makalah, menerima lebih dari 213 anugerah dan pengiktirafan, menyampaikan lebih daripada 425 makalah termasuk 376 ceramah dan pleno jemputan, plenary ya serta 39 ucap tama di peringkat nasional dan antarabangsa. Di atas kecemerlangan dalam bidang sains dan teknologi, Prof. Datuk Asma telah terpilih ke Akademi Sains Malaysia pada tahun 2003, terpilih ke Akademi Sciences for the Developing World, TUAS, pada tahun 2010 dan The Islamic World Academy of Sciences pada tahun 2016. Selain itu, panjang lagi ya Datuk, Tapi kena baca juga so that kita semua sedar yang kita sekarang berada berada bersama seorang tokoh sekolah eh, berada bersama-sama kita insyaAllah. Selain itu, beliau juga menerima pengiktirafan sebagai honorary member of the Iranian Academy of Medical Sciences, member of the College of Fellows, Kiel University dan governing advisory board member for Ritsu Meikan Asia Pacific University, Japan. Sebagai penghargaan di atas kepimpinan dalam aspek pembelajaran sepanjang hayat di peringkat Commonwealth, terutama terhadap golongan wanita, di samping perkhidmatan cemerlang dalam memajukan pendidikan tinggi sains dan teknologi di Malaysia, beliau telah dianugerahkan sebagai Honorary Fellow of the Commonwealth of Learning pada September 2019 dan Honorary Scholar for Institute for Applied System Analysis Vienna, Austria pada 2019. Institusi terkemuka turut juga mengiktiraf Prof. Datuk Asma menerusi penganugerahan ijazah kehormat Dr. Science dari University of Glasgow, University Glasgow, Dr. Ijazah Kehormat University Kiel, Dr. Kehormat Sastra dari Kyoto University of Foreign Studies, serta turut diangkat sebagai University Thomas Hart Benton Mural Medallion. Walaupun turut aktif, walaupun aktif di peringkat antarabangsa, 
Prof. Dato' Asmah tidak pernah alpa untuk terus menyumbang kepada pembangunan dan kemajuan akademia di negara ini. Beliau merupakan perintis dalam penubuhan anugerah akademik negara yang berprestij, penubuhan universiti penyelidikan di Malaysia dan turut memberi sumbangan yang amat besar dalam penghasilan Plan Pembangunan Pendidikan Malaysia Pendidikan Tinggi 2015-2025. Di atas sumbangan unggul dalam sektor pendidikan tinggi di samping penyelidikan dan inovasi khususnya bidang sains dan teknologi di peringkat lokal mahupun global, maka negara telah mengiktiraf beliau sebagai tokoh Sri Kandi Akademik pada tahun 2018 dan tokoh Maulidul Rasul pada tahun 2019. Banyak lagi kejayaan dan kecemerlangan Prof. Dato' Asma yang tidak sempat, tidak mungkin sempat saya kongsikan uh, bersama sama ada dalam bidang akademik, penyelidikan, perundingan dan bidang kepakaran beliau. Kalau nak minta CV beliau boleh ya? Eh? Tebal. Okay. Di atas faktor kecemerlangan dan kegemilangan inilah, maka hari ini kita amat bertuah kerana dapat bersama-sama mendengar perkongsian yang bakal disampaikan oleh yang berbahagia Prof. Datuk Dr. Asma Ismail sebentar saja lagi. Diharapkan sesi perkongsian pada pagi ini akan dapat memberi inspirasi, meluaskan pengetahuan dan pengalaman kita bersama. Akhir kata, pohon berangan berteduh serama, subur merimbun bunga melati, ilmu dikongsi manfaat bersama, anjakkan warga membina universiti. Dengan ini saya sudahi ucapan dengan wabillahi taufik wal hidayah wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh Majlis merakamkan ucapan terima kasih kepada yang berbahagia Datuk Wira Naib Chancellor di atas ucapan aluan sebentar tadi Hadirin sekalian tanpa membuang masa majlis diteruskan dengan executive talk yang bertajuk Where is higher education heading post COVID-19 Justru itu, majlis dengan berbesar hati menjemput yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Asma Ismail untuk naik ke pentas majlis dengan penuh hormatnya mempersilakan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. And a very good morning. Um, yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Wira Dr. Raha binti Abdul Rahim, Naib Chancellor UTEM. Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk um, Teknologis Dr. Shahrin bin Sahib, um, FASC, Fellow Academy, um, mantan Naib Chancellor UTEM. Semua pengurusan tertinggi universiti, pegawai-pegawai kanan universiti um, yang berusaha Encik Mat, Zar Mat Zarif bin Mahat, Ketua Pegawai Operasi yang berusaha Encik Muhammad Azmi um, bin Mat Said, Ketua Bahagian Pembangunan Bakat Pejabat Pendaftar. Semua hadirin, um, hadirat sekalian and everybody out there who's listening to this particular executive talk. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Datuk Yara Raha um, dan semua tim daripada UTEM, especially bahagian pendaftar, for inviting me for the executive talk to share my thoughts on where is higher education heading post-COVID-19. But I also like to acknowledge the presence of fellows of Academy of Science uh, who's here in the room and probably part of the audience. And if there's any members of the Young Scientist Network, I also would like to acknowledge their presence. So today we will be discussing time for change in terms of where higher education is going. I will be covering in terms of uh, what is living in a changing world, the impact of COVID-19 
on higher education, the impact of COVID-19, especially because this is UTEM, so we will be concentrating on uh, Tibet and skills development, uh, performing impactful research, which is the way forward for the country and what is the way forward for higher education itself. So ladies and gentlemen, let me start by saying that we are living in a changing world, facing a lot of unknowns. And uh, of course, as you know, due to the uh, digital age, due to the disruptive technologies uh, brought about by Industry 4.0, um, global economic crisis, as we all are very much aware, global competition due to globalization. Another disruptor now that needs to be looked into also is climate change. And of course, one of the biggest disruptors of them all is a COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And all of this have basically created a disruptive change in higher education. And the question is, what does or how COVID-19 pandemic has uh, created an impact on education. It has definitely disrupted higher education, especially due to the closure of schools and universities in 188 countries in the world, aimed basically to flatten the curve. And that basically took, I don't think you realized it, it took 91% of the world's students from primary, secondary, tertiary, all the way to the universities and colleges, about 1.6 billion or 91% of the world's students out of the classrooms, of which 574 million uh, of them are in the Commonwealth countries. And Malaysia is one of the Commonwealth countries. And what has happened is that, of course, besides the closure, it has also caused a funding crisis for universities um, especially for the private universities. And that's because of the fact that international students now have to go home and we do not know if and when they will return. And the COVID-19 crisis basically highlighted the importance of technology-enabled education via distance and also via online learning. And this is the new concept now that we are now moving uh, universities and schools from education in the classroom to now education at home and eventually education anywhere. So this is now the new concept that is now happening. And yet, many countries are ill-prepared to do so, including our own. And while we are facing COVID-19, while we say MCO, while we say close the universities and the schools and the polytechnics, we also did not instigate the use of alternative technologies in the areas that are without internet or electricity. And as a result, in the recent meeting with KPPT, uh, states that almost 70% of all students from the IPTA are actually without internet when they start to go home. And therefore, when you start to say, now education to go to the home, that's pretty big uh, numbers that cannot access to the internet. And, uh, and I'm sure you have read in the paper in uh, other states uh, where the students have to climb the tree yeah, to get the, the internet. I challenge the engineers, why do the student have to climb the tree? Because you can have generated a very good antenna that can now be able to now pull the signals. So this is the new challenge of R&D that engineers now start to need to start to think about. It's not about high tech alone, it's about making Technology now accessible, available for everyone to now study and get learning done. Okay, so we on the the online response to cope during the pandemic basically has widened the inequalities of educational opportunities between the have and the have-nots. This is what is now showing. So the teachers and lecturers are also not trained to do online learning. And many countries were not prepared to provide alternative technologies to educate the students who do not have access to the internet. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, as MQA, I worry. Because the fact that you are just taking your lessons, your lectures, converting it to Zoom, and you say that this is now the in online learning. This is not online learning. So that's why you need to now to be trained for interactive online learning because if by just changing that, it's just a matter of digitalization. It is not yet online learning. And for a long time, this is what is happening, why we are facing this kind of problem. Because higher education have always resisted change. Brick and mortar still prevail. 
UTEM, USM, everybody is still in the mindset of brick and mortar. And we continue to say to EPU and development, can I have another building? Can I have another building? Because we need to bring in more students. So this mindset change now has got to now have a new paradigm shift, right? So brick and mortar still prevail despite, despite the fact that we are saying the disruptors is now going to be industry 4.0. Somehow, yeah, yeah, we hear it, but we don't really appreciate what is going on, right? Until you get hit with COVID-19. Until you get hit with COVID-19, you have to close. And when you have to close, you have to now find the alternative. So this is why COVID-19 has basically shaken higher education to the core. All right? And despite we talk about I, uh, Industry 4.0, universities still use low tech in order to now talk about education. Because we are so used to face-to-face -face teaching that why do we bother to invest, all right? In, in the, you will now find that there is necessary now to start to invest in the digital tools. So the traditional campus-based universities have difficulties to transform, but overnight they have to face, they have to see the change from face-to-face -face now replaced by online learning. And now they realize blended learning is now the way forward. So the key word here is blended learning. It's not, dalam blueprint also we are stating not more than 70% online. That means it's not 100%. Malaysia does not advocate, at least from the blueprint, Malaysia does not advocate because we have done a lot of studies that show that total online does not do it also. So it has to be blended learning. But that every cloud has a silver lining. So we see that the crisis also provides an opportunity for the development of more flexible. So suddenly when we close the university, boleh pula buat flexible education. Dulu, you don't even want to think about it. But now you can do it, all right? So we can now have more flexible learning solutions that make better use of distance learning and digital tools. With online learning, you can now be taught by some of the best faculties in the country. So webinars now. You don't have to register, you don't have to pay Yuran. Oh, that's really cheap. And you get access now to so many of the best talks, right? All you have to do is blast who's talking, when, and then what is the link, and that's it. Everybody now can start to listen to the person. Before, you have to register, you have to pay Yuran. If you can't afford it, you can't listen to this guy. So these are now the new uh, things, uh, creating greater outreach for dialogues, for discussions. Last night, the uh, day before, I was having discussion with WHO and suddenly all the academies around the world is now discussing about some topic on dual usage of research. So basically, uh, the world now is borderless. Yeah? And learning is no longer bound by traditional semesters, residential time, you know, even at USM, we do have to spend at least one year in university to be a graduate from University of South Malaysia. All that now can be out of the window because residential time now is no longer necessary because we are going online. So why do you have to be in the, in, in the, in the university? So, and then there's no time uh, is wasted while traveling campus, you know, look at dorm, trying to get the bus. Oh, it's cheaper now, mana benari. It's cheaper now, you don't have to pay for buses now to carry and ferry the student from the desa siswa, from the dorms all the way to the classes because now they don't have to be here. The, this era of technology-enabled learning allows for greater numbers of student accessibility to higher education. Right now, you are no longer limited to the students as provided by EPU. The world now is open for you to have students from anywhere around the world. And this is now the new mode of income generation that you need to now think about. So education tomorrow, you know, I'm going to come to this, education tomorrow is no longer about enrollment is about probably subscription. Just like you have Netflix, right? Because tomorrow is not, you, you have many now universities in the world, Harvard is giving all their courses for free. Why would UTEM charge? Why would I want to be paying for UTEM course when I can be listening to Yale, Harvard, Stanford for free? So when you have free versus somebody who's charging, something has got to give. So now it's a matter of collegiality, commonality, working together between IPTA, IPTS, to now probably come up with a, um, I call it uh, Malaysian global online courses, instead of Netflix, but the concept now is subscription, right? 
for Netflix is subscription versus enrollment. So even Bedahari has got to change the mindset now because that's the trend for tomorrow. If you don't do it, somebody else will. The UNESCO, now the question is how does COVID-19 impact TVET? and skills development, because that is now more relevant to you. The UNESCO Institute of Statistics estimates that as of 2018, worldwide, there are 73.7 million TVET students. All right? And the COVID-19 crisis highlighted the importance of technology-enabled education via distance and online. This, however, has a huge impact on TVET because TVET is about learning by doing. TVET cannot go online 100% and therefore it's not easy. That's why I put it in red. While the government says go online, they have forgotten about the TVET part. So the TVET part does not easily migrate to distance and online learning, as you are very much aware. So when we move and when we tell the universities to move to technology-enabled learning, we need to be asking three questions first. First is the quality of the lecturer. Are they ready, prime time, to be able now to deliver proper quality online learning? All right. Kedua, what about the learner experience? Have you now done an R&D or a survey to find out how do the student perceive this? Are they happy with this? All right. And how many percent are actually happy with this? The third one is the learning outcome. It's not about you teaching via Zoom, via Google Meet, via Web WebEx. It's not about that. It's about the question whether the student learn. It's no longer about teaching, it's about learning. So you have to check somehow whether the learning does happen or not. So despite what I had to say, the technical vocation or TVET program still plays a very important role in COVID-19 pandemic because the pandemic itself, together with TVET, is actually going three phases. I don't know whether you realize it or not. First phase is the coping phase. Second phase is the intermediate phase when schools and universities and businesses start to open, which is right now. And the next one you need to be ready is the recovery period, where now the structural changes are expected in both the education and in the labour market. How now do you position UTEM to now be ready for the recovery period? Let's talk about the coping phase. The pandemic, as I say, forces universities to bring all courses online, right? Short-term measure, okay, but not for long-term measure, not for TVET education. Short-term measure, okay. So the TVET program, as we see it, struggle. It's not you alone, this is also worldwide. Struggle because practical skills are acquired by learning by doing, and therefore the student actually need to be in the workshops, they need to be in the labs, they need to be uh, where the machines and the materials uh, through hands-on experience in the workplace. And of course, when you say bring education from the classroom to the homes, all these materials that's there in the lab um, are basically and the equipment are not found in the homes. So that will be a difficult one. So to cope for short term, instructors uh, basically develop approaches to reach as many students as possible to effectively use the online resources. So for short term measure, um, Practical and training around the world have been simulated via internet, via radio, via television, via virtual and augmented reality. How many universities actually do this? Right? So some countries in the Commonwealth already, like India, they went all the way, all the way to internet, to radio, television, uh, virtual augmented reality so they can actually be able to cope but like I said this is for short term measure the TVET providers uh, or the students can actually also for short term measure go to Udemy or go to uh, Coursera there are many already available online courses then you can check many of these courses yang uh, lebih kurang sama macam curriculum that you now want the students there so you can now have the students uh, go on and take up these courses uh, for the, for to cover uh, what needs to be there and they have done some very beautiful ones and you can see that the courses Udemy, Coursera, all that is uh, relatively very cheap and in the Commonwealth essentially during the pandemic uh, for the poor countries, these poor countries of the Commonwealth actually have went uh, straight away to uh, Commonwealth of Learning, negotiated with Coursera and gave 10,000 free licenses for all the poor uh, students so that they can now get access to any of the Coursera courses. We should have done that, but we also didn't do that. So if we, we, if we had done all these things, there's a lot already resources 
quality resources that is already available. Tak payah buat balik, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Do something else that is going to be different. So that is something we need to talk about. So for TBET, bottom line, you need to do blended learning via online, via face-to-face -face offline, and face-to-face uh, -face offline mentorship and experiential learning. Don't forget that what makes a student is the experiential learning, the community engagement, all that needs to be there. So when they do the courses, uh, what they found is that when they do the courses online, there are still concepts that the student don't quite understand. This is where now they do face-to-face -face offline mentorship. Either they come here or uh, they, they can do via Zoom or something that you discuss further with the students, right? So this is, and of course, expression learning, community engagement need to be there. So this is now the intermediate phase. What you do now? This, this is very important. This is the time, ladies and gentlemen, to invest now in the digital tools and learning technologies, including hiring of instructional designers, uh, buying some student engagement tools. If you read uh, you will find that artificial intelligence uh, is being used a lot now to facilitate teaching and learning. And then now people are using blockchain uh, to now uh, replace convocation. There's no need for convocation now. By using blockchain, it's more effective. The students get all these things now on the phone. And you, whenever they go and see an employer for, uh, uh, for interview, the employer can just access to your details uh, via the blockchain. So there's a lot of things that can be done. But like I said, we never investigate any of this. We see television, we, see, we hear the radio, but we never use the com uh, and even now uh, in the Commonwealth, they are using the handphone. So it's called Mobi MOOCs, Mobile MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. So it's called Mobi, M-O-B-I, Mobi MOOCs. So many things have been done, but Malaysia, tak buat benda ni. We're just sitting there and say, oh, kesian. And what is our solution? Bring the student on campus, but so that they have access to the internet, so that we are still doing this online. So something has got to now change in the way we are approaching and providing solution. How come the poor countries of the Commonwealth can come up with radio, television, internet, all this uh, mob mobile uh, handphone? Because for those young illiterate, you know how we they train other people, they they listen. Because if you have to read, you are illiterate. So therefore, they can be teaching melalui mobi MOOCs, but we don't even do that. So this, this is what I'm trying to say. This is your challenge for R&D now. How do we now concentrate on this? This is our core business. This is our amana, And we're not doing this thing right. So, so this is also the time to undergo training of the lecturers to produce quality online courses. So I can imagine the next executive talk will be inviting Professor Karim Alias from USM that is teaching about micro-credentials, that is teaching about how to do MOOCs. Maybe you should call and have a workshop after that, right? This is also the time to do research on alternative technologies. Why are we just banking on the internet, whereas there are so many alternative technologies that is now available? Why are we not looking into that as engineers? Come on, this should be a challenge to you now to see all these things. And how now do we facilitate accessibility of education to the marginalized? There are many of uh, the, our students, especially from IPTA, banyak daripada B40, so they don't have access. Even if they do have access, they don't have access to many computers. Imagine dalam satu rumah, adik dia semua kena go online, dia pun kena go online. How are they competing for the one computer? Right? So these kind of things uh, need to be looked into. This is the time to consolidate management to mainstream online learning. A lot of the vice chancellors, um, bukan Professor Raha, tapi a lot of the vice chancellors consider online learning makhluk-makhluk yang buat micro-credential tu PM tepi. You understand that? Oh, something they're quite interested, so tak apalah kita galakkan, kita bukan. But right now, if you are an IPTS, you know already by now, online learning is here to stay. And you better be mainstreaming and putting online learning as part and parcel of your academic uh, punya, uh, program for income generation or whatever. It's no longer pm tepi And it cannot be just one or two lecturers doing this thing. It has to be a consolidated management effort to now move on online learning. Yeah? But blended. Faham? Eh? Blended, right? And there are three ways. One is online learning. 
Kedua, income generation is lifelong learning. Those people who want to have knowledge, but not necessarily they want a degree out of it. Right? So that's lifelong learning. The next one is life-wide learning. So life-wide learning, because now with the many unknowns coming under Industry 4.0 and other unknowns, today COVID-19, tomorrow will be another pandemic or another crisis, and God knows what climate change will now do in the future. So there are many unknowns. So all these things, right, uh, we now will change our role uh, even the job that we do, today we are lecturer, tomorrow we may be obsolete and we can do something else. So we will we also be changing jobs and that's why life-wide learning is now very important. Imagine Masa MCO, a lot of us now finally learn cooking, uh, finally learn gardening, finally learn something that we have not done before. And what do we do? We use YouTube. That YouTube is actually life-wide learning. All right? So benda-benda yang yang kita belajar because we want to learn about it you know so there is also uh, also the time to housewife or wife to now think about how to cut the hair of the husband tak ha huh. so you can buy the the gunting from the online and then you can learn how to cut uh, of course some husband prefer the janggut so we have to maintain that okay so um, also time to develop training modules Training modules, because there are a lot of people who will be out of a job. Remember, COVID-19 has created many people out of a job. They need now to be reskilled, they need to be upskilled, and they need to come in to learn about all this. This is where now you prepare these courses. So there are many types, many ways now for you to income generate, if only you are creative. Yeah? Because we now need, and also you need to prepare people for reskill and upskill for the future workforce adaptability post covid this i will share with you later so in the preparing for the recovery phase this is now is a dog eat dog depending on how creative the the the, v, the vc and the top management and how fast agile response uh, by the university so the covid-19 recovery phase provides opportunity to build better programs and better systems to ensure resilience. Bukan respond. The problem now is, berlaku COVID-19, we respond. Cara macam ni. But the question now is resilient. How do we respond so that we are stable? Doesn't matter what pandemic, what climate change crisis, we will be okay. Faham? That's the word resilient. That's what we need to now move into. So in this phase, TVET can cater to students who drop out during school closures and reskill, upskill to those who are now and unemployed. And um, this is the time also. Maybe you don't realize it, but tomorrow with the advent of many machines and robots, human-human interaction is muy, muy importante. Therefore, I'm speaking Spanish now. So bottom line is that you need now to have uh, dalam you punya courses, right, the development of fundamental cognitive, socioeconomic skills like sympathy, empathy, compassion to nurture values-based graduates. And these values-based graduates must have attributes like agility, flexibility, adaptability, and communication skills. So this is now more important. Why? Because when you move to blockchain, when you move to all this technology that is now using uh, the concept of artificial intelligence, everything is done for you. The only thing not done is to convince people to accept the package. Right? That is human-human interaction. That is why if you now look at the papers, they are now saying people in science and technology, they will now be moving forward. But the one who makes more money than the people in science technology are the people in humanities and social science. Because they are the managers. They are the ones who will convince people to use what people in science and technology and engineering are developing. Right? So the best concept is to have the engineers of tomorrow that is humanized. Because then when they develop the innovation, they already think of the people in mind. It's not just an engineering solution to humanity. So that's why we are moving now to values-based education, which is what is advocated in the blueprint anyway. So according to LinkedIn, uh, they have also done the survey and find out among all the employers that soft skills is now increasingly valued and, uh, in the current era of technology and machines, and it will improve creativity and employability of your students. 
Next question, post-recovery. How now you want to prepare Malaysia and how now Tibet will now play education, uh, a role in education to make, it, uh, in, to make it resilient. What are the challenges faced by local high-tech industries? All right? most, Malaysia's most in-demand jobs uh, by Talent Corp, numero uno, is engineering and then followed by ICT. So what does that make you? You are, all your graduates will be zapped up. So that means to say, if you produce good quality graduates, they will all be uh, a better engineer in the future. And so Malaysia is short of scientists and engineers. We need about 500,000 by 2020, but this is already 2020. We're only about 16,000 a year producing. Basically, on the average, we have only about 37% of the student uh, actually doing uh, science technology. So. In terms of engineering, this is what engineering and software talent shortage, the shortage of the technical talent in engineering, you need to now be making sure your students are also moving in this direction. Uh, artificial intelligence, understanding robotics, advanced automation, coding, advanced analytic, uh, preventing, uh, adopt, uh, 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 analytic preventing adoption of the uh, uh, industry 4.0. The curriculum exists, but uh, institutions of higher learning actually cannot catch up with what is needed by the industry, especially now when you're down as far as PT is concerned, when you don't, your budget is now reduced, even more difficult for you to now be um, uh, at par with what the industries would need. So the high proportion of top talents, therefore, from Malaysia are leaving, as you know, to neighbouring countries, uh, being hired, and top 25% of our graduates are all hired by the uh, multinationals uh, in Malaysia and also around the world, and uh, basically even before they finish their final exam. So um, also it's negatively perceived the attractiveness of manufacturing among the public, especially the panggil mat, mat kilang or whatever. So that kind of perceived uh, concept is not helping our industries. So if you look at the UTEM data, um, uh, kebolehan pasaran graduan, your graduate empl employability, um, kalau tengok data, UMP 96, UPNM 93, forget about UPNM, UTEM, UTHM, UNIMAP. So the M tone, uh, are actually now top. Well, it's not surprising, isn't it? Because I just showed to you what Talent Corp is saying. What people need now is engineers. But the problem is that when we found in National Science Council, when we talked to the industries, the engineers are actually getting less salary now than the engineers of before. Right? So it's dah lah susah nak buat STEM. Bila dah dapat engineering, your salary is not as high. So bottom line sekarang ni, it does not encourage a lot of the students to continue to take up engineering. So as a result, your number of uh, places are still many yang empty. All right? So now, uh, for now, engineers are still a necessity and that's how you see the graduate employability rise for UTEM. So for how long? For how long, right? If tomorrow in the recovery period there is going to be a difference in the need, and it's no longer about engineers, it's now about data people, data scientists, and all that, it will shift base again. So, so this is some of the things you need to anticipate. So, the thing and the best way is to enhance job creators rather than job seekers. At the moment now, with 93.5 etc., we are still talking about job uh, seekers not job creators. So the blueprint is also asking, because I think your self-employed is about 11.06. So basically, you need to encourage uh, more of the students to be now more confident and actually become job creators. And this is where in the recovery period, you need to now facilitate the local companies that are ready for emerging industry. Because UTEM wants to do high-skill technologies, high-skill engineers. We are not talking about low-skill. So therefore, high-skill means you have to catch up lah with what the local industry require. So and a lot of us cannot catch up because their requirement is still higher than kita punya ability to show and deliver. So as a result, that's why the bashing always happen. Why the students, they say it's not yet industry ready, not yet industry ready. So we have to look at all these factors uh, as well. And now that the National Science Council has approved for the formation of technology and assembly. So one of the member is Professor Datuk Raha. So she does know about this. So if you now want to move forward, 
How what do you do? You tengok benda hari, benda hari kata mana ada duit. Okay, fine. Alright. So, then the next thing you kata tak ada duit. No, so what do we do? Collaborate. Collaborate. Industry have the money. They have the technology. We don't have. But what do we have? We have the brains. We have the expert. Which we can now be retrained, retooled to actually now pick up the knowledge faster. So that we can be their trainers. This is what collaboration is all about. So when you collaborate, these are now the new kid in town. This is called technology assemblies. All right. These are now industry credential certification of courses or program. Because the industry cannot wait from the IPTA and or IPTS, the industry readiness concept that they want, because they are moving already into high tech, we cannot deliver. So what they have done is they have come up with their own consortium. Right and come up with this industry credential certification. So if you look at all this, nampak all these are uh, example in Pulau Pinang in Penang. Uh, I borrowed this from Bitrox. So this um, consortium of um, this is now going to be a revolutionary new technology future skill school that will equip the aspiring students with industry ready skill required for the fast moving technology sector. So basically you find here all of these companies they all need engineers they all need people to work na diploma level etc. So what they have done is they come together they pay for the uh, formation uh, of the well, they come together. They they created the syllabus that will be as soon as the student graduate, they can be hired by all these companies, and they now create competency-based education. While we are still examining the student in terms of assessment, but the engineering group, Skani, the future, ladies and gentlemen, is con competency-based assessment. Like I said, it's not about how is about did you learn so if you learn then you are competent and you can show the competency base so there's a lot of adjustments in terms of paradigm shift that we all need to do but what is happening is that as soon as these students graduate after two years the industry at the moment while they are studying the industry pay for the tuition fees and they will be employed upon graduation and minimum salary they want is three thousand ringgit for a diploma certificate so bottom line skani they are the potential competitor to Mtone. Because right now, is the degree a trump card? I ask you now. Under Industry 4.0, a lot of companies now don't care about whether you got CGPA 4.0 ka, you graduate from USM ka, you graduate, they don't care. Do they will have some testing during the interview? As soon as the graduate can show competency and can perform, they hire the graduate. They don't even look at the academic transcript anymore. And therefore, those who show competency in providing the solution will be the one that is hired by the industry. So bottom line, we're no longer talking about um, you know, the degree. So the degree itself no longer is the trump card. So that's why I said if universities uh, shifting their paradigm, they also need to understand. And that's why we need to be the hybrid. We want to be, you want to be creating technology scholars. Mm -hmm. You want to have that, fine. But make sure they are the balance between their academic and their punya competency. Baru sekarang ni, they will make a difference. Alright? So we need to now be more um, creative in how we do things. Alright? And because I say the potential ni because tomorrow MQA is also looking at accrediting uh, the structured syllabus created by the industry because they had that particular pathway and they will now be able to enter the university for later to get masters or PhD as well. Nampak? So if you are not careful, because all students will go here because they have tuition fee lagi paid, everything is paid, and then on top of that guaranteed job. Siapa tak nak? Okay, Raha dah tak dah boleh duduk dah. Okay, so therefore, right? So how now do we? Okay, Raha, I have a solution. How now do you do more with less? Huh? So basically, this is the time you need to now be in the front line to work with the industry and become the trainers. They don't have enough people. They don't have the knowledge. They have the competency. So therefore, you be the one to say, I have the knowledge. I'll be able to, but 
at the same time, you're learning the latest technology that is there provided by the industry. So this is where you want to do this and you want to negotiate to so M tone students are actually trained as part of their 2U2I or 3U1I in the 